Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Good morning.
And this is how incredible my interview was with me. It came about by a church minister that thought I had potential to come to the school and do something that was significant as a brain and also learn and develop my skills as a human being, as a sportsman, in an academic. And what happened then with that, obviously, was uh, the fact that I was in the first year where the word multiracial became apparent in this country in terms of education. It was the first, it was 1991, but it was 1990 that the declaration came through. And we then suddenly were, oh my word, there's an option for you to go to a white school across the road. Well, it wasn't across the road, it was six passes later from the nation. And uh, while I was playing with the emotion, as I spoke to the school right now, was, as I was standing there sharing the story of the journey with the boys of the school, I suddenly had flashbacks of what it actually cost us as a family to get me to my parents, etc. And that journey. And that's the story that a lot of my best mates in school that I haven't even heard of knew about, but I played first in rugby with, and played rugby from an 14 right through. So it was quite incredible to revisit that and go through that journey again. You know, and uh, important, I think, for context, because let me share something that I don't think you might have known or think about as part of your generation or even the current generation who are millennials. As a person of colour entering the school for the first time, there were only four of us that started in grade six. I mean, in standard six, that's grade eight at the time. Four in a school of a thousand, uh, what are we, a thousand? Yeah, 795 books, sorry. Yes, I remember now, 795. So you stuck out like a sore thumb, man. You could run, but you can't hide it. <laughs> and people were watching you with a magnifying glass, I tell you, because everyone wanted to see what's going to happen. Can they handle coming from a different background of school into this wonderful institution, which is the great? And can they actually move into this institution and actually survive? Many came during those first five years of the school opening up and didn't make it. Many came on scholarships. Uh, they were just so happy to get a meal while staying in the hospital that they had lost focus of just training for that. And then it's very soon to come on, etc. And failed at everything. So the, the process and the integration didn't work. But many did succeed and many moved forward. But what I found interesting, and what you might know, is that the, the, the first few of us that started the school, it was a very difficult time. I'm going to go back to my notes now because I don't want to leave anything out if you don't mind. Here it goes. It says, after my interview with these Dr. Gordon, my folks, he said to me, after coming first at your school at West End Primary and being the best at academic sport in the end of your school, how are you going to handle not, you know, not being the best yet? Yeah, because the standards obviously can be a lot different and could be higher. How are you going to handle it in terms of the standard of academic sport? And my answer to him was, sir, I'll try harder. I mean, what else do you say to him? Really ask you a question. So that was the mentality, and but with that came a lot of pressure. You can imagine with the first group of guys. Uh, pressure of being under magnifying glass all the time. The sad part was that the rest of the boys in the school weren't prepared for that. The rest of the boys in the school saw people of colour coming to the school as a handout. They thought they, they assumed everyone coming to the bank was on bursary. People that played rugby in my team thought I was on bursary. That's the only one I had my poor parents couldn't afford it. They sold everything they had. We didn't have a house. I lived in a caravan behind someone's house on a plot in the northern suburbs of Port Elizabeth and took six taxis to get to school every day. And no one knew that. My friends didn't know it. One or two of the teachers knew because they made an effort at the time. But the mentality of judging or the sense of entitlement was the thing that hurt the most, I think, when you're trying to integrate society naturally. And that was quite an eye opener for me because then you realize that people, when they look at you, they don't see you as a person, they see you as an experiment, really. And that's what I felt like at that time. So that's something that one never talks about for like 27 years, and yeah, back up 27 years, and now the climate is so wonderful that I don't feel insecure to talk about the wonderful changes that I've heard. I walk in the passages at Ray now, and I hear guys speaking Corsa. And I, it's totally different. You know what? You can't find the token for people. Because there are hundreds of people in the school now. And it's more balanced and integrated. So I look in the school, and it's so weird to see people of color between, <laughs> between the people of the grade. And while that's important, ladies and gentlemen, I think we can choose to, to focus a lot on how we differ from the people around us. 
that aligns and you feel that as a way of approaching the topic of enhancing relationships and communication with students specifically about rather focusing on what you have in common with people as a common ground and how easy that will facilitate new relationships and friendships. What do we have in common at the level of the people that are there and attend school at the Start with that dialogue and we'll see what happens. Very interesting to look at it from that perspective. Nevertheless, so I'm rushing through some really important things here, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. And the things that I think are important to keep in mind. So I mentioned uh, in one few articles about like your part of the church and experiment at the time, everybody interacts, plays with a new toy, but really few want to get to know the intricacy and details of your life at the time. Uncomfortable topics were avoided most of the time, and everyone just wanted to fit into the system. And there you go. So that was quite interesting. But anyway. Enough about that. When we look at the schedule of entering that system where the opportunities and leadership and skill sets and expertise, they were in I mentioned potential and possibility being a really big thing for me when I attended the school. There were opportunities from five in the morning and practicing your kicking, because I'll be doing that first team kicker in my final year. They were all remember that, yes. You didn't have a kicker, you never have that you kicked it if you found him in uh, yeah. uh, to kick, uh, I had to kick for goals in my matric year, so instead of nine, every instead of nine, I had to start practicing. And as a wing, I had to kick for goals in the final year, so it was a need. And we developed a bit more. But five o'clock in the morning, there'd be days when you involved with that. One of the only ways to meet girls was to go to ballroom dancing. <laughs> the great age of socials happened like once every hour in three, four months. And Brian Adams would come to it, please forgive me. No, no, you didn't know where to put your hands when you got it. It's just so scared. You know, it's so nervous, it's so exciting. Well, your eyes are sparkling. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I look back at that and I think, what was the neuroscience behind all that? And then you realize, oh my, goodness, that's the common ground. We all have hormones. We all go through changes and beautiful challenges in life. Where we, that's where the memories come in. And we had so many laughs around that. You know, when someone went through a tough time and a pain, we go through it with them. But vulnerability, as I'm discovering with leadership, is something very really interesting. I grew up in a very involved in the church, a very happy, clappy church, the A40 Elizabeth. And I'm still very much a happy, clappy kind of guy. But the difference is the following I always thought it's a sign of weakness to show vulnerability as a leader and as a manager. And as but in a world where people can fake it till they make it, in a world where everyone lives according to what they see and feel on Facebook, we're in a place now where the genuineness of people's experience from which they speak from shouldn't make them weaker in people's eyes. In fact, it should make them more credible and make them more believable, more real to connect. And I think that's something really special that in my life I'm trying to teach and impart to my children. My boys are 20, 13 next month, and my youngest is 10. So I try to impart the same to them as well. So I hope that makes you think just a little bit about that component. So how did this great ethos then? Let's move on quickly. I'm getting stuck into you, uh, but I'm forgetting about the talk. Here we go. Start moving. Here we go. So dive into the world I've shared with you. How did the great help prepare me for life? Well. Help me adapt, so to me, to lots of things. But adapting, the, 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 the badge there is three joined in one. So obviously that's sport, academics, culture. Or on a higher level, <coughs> body, mind, spirit. I'm now in the health and wellness industry. We are working wellness every single day. We would look specifically at the changing model of wellness and what it means to truly be well. In the Global Wellness Report, so that we played place last on the G20 nation of the world, for things like life perspective alcoholism, diabetes. We placed last of the G20 nations. And you ask yourself why. There are resources, there is expertise. Why? So when we look at that wellness, the journey has been quite incredible. And if I, if I don't mention this, I'll be very sorry. Do you know how we got to the modern theory of wellness? We started off in the bodies, the theories of spiritual wellness being the cause of your happiness. In other words, 
And Afrikaner says, as you saw me, that is what you me, then you have a terrible death. If you're not even in alignment with your maker in a spiritual sense, you'll die a painful death and have unpleasant experiences in your life. A lot of Eastern, Eastern uh, teachings came to that in their lives. We then moved through the, the era when we looked at the Vikings, the Greeks, the Romans, where the greed for power and the need to, 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 to find land and acquire land and take over uh, you know, positions of power and, and, and greed for money grow the process of the need for power. Where they decided to design war, or warfare weapons according to killing quickly so that they win the, the war and claim the land. They need to be able to understand how to design weapons, where to cut someone with that lead out of the They started cutting out bodies. Started looking inside the tree, the bronchial tree, looking at the brain, how it connects to the spinal cord, looking at the auto, it's being puffed in muscle, and all the big, thick blood vessels inside. And so people have realized, oh, if I, if I poke them there, that will end quickly, we can get down this battle a lot quicker. <laughs> Game of Thrones, Vikings, here we go. So the, the physical theories were then born of understanding the human body, and thank goodness for the Greeks and the Romans, your forefathers. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Love it. So, you know, we got a map of the body in Germany, of the physical body, and that was so incredible. <coughs> and now we're at a place where we realize, oh my shattered nerves, being truly well involves an integrated biopsychosocial model of wellness. Biology is connected to the social relationships and social happiness, is connected to the psychological well being and happiness. How do I prove this? Anyone gone through a breakup? Breakup yet? Yeah. Don't put your hands up. Anyone gone through a, a, a loss of grieving someone after COVID? Anyone gone through a stressful time at work? Not knowing if you're going to have your job after COVID. Not knowing if you're going to stay married after COVID after having to spend time with someone that you haven't had to spend so much time with. Relationships can go either way with COVID. Eh? I promise you, it's not that it's a serious thing. I mean, it's quite serious. Anyway, long and short. So understanding that biopsychosocial is so connected, you go through a tough time, your body's pumping acid in the stomach, you're not eating properly, the acid goes the hole in your stomach, you get an ulcer. We call it a stress ulcer. You get anemia, you get anemic, you're just breathing into your stools, you don't know that you've got an ulcer, you become weak, tired, and pale. So for example, of how the biology is connected to the physical and the psychological well-being. You don't sleep properly, you're really stressing, you get on the nervous, nervous anticipation of an event uh, of a happening in your life. What does sleep do? Those who are immunity makes you susceptible to, to infection. The immune system can't be great. It's all linked. So you, there's now no doubt that how you are socially, your relationships affect your physical body, the hormone levels. Cortisol, steroids, is the number one hormone in the body that responds to stress as you know. What happens if you feed someone synthetic steroids? We are my rugby players. <laughs> no, none of our brave boys take steroids, of course. No. So understanding that steroids, besides causing testicular atrophy, can lead to a lot of other medical problems, like water retention, Cushing syndrome, swelling up, etc., etc. So steroids, you make naturally in your body as you respond to stress. That's why chronic stress is bad for your wellness. You got the point? Biopsychosocial, very integrated, modern theory of wellness. That's where we're at today. Everyone happy? Well, so much I want to share with you. So start. <laughs> right. So how did Greg prepare me in terms of that? Let's give you a quick uh, three joining one: the body, mind, and spirit. How did how did that help me? So sports and physical health, culture, music, etc. Public speaking, dancing, academics. The athletics, besides being uh, gifted with the most gorgeous calves, my athletics coach, Michelle Durant, if you're listening, forgive us, we've all looked at your calves during school and we love your calves. Here, yeah, Michelle. And uh, she was just an absolutely out outstanding sprinting coach that took me for athletics. But what I learned through that experience, for example, was discipline. She trained us and pushed our limits so much. Brickmakers saw a lot of our vomiting, unfortunately. And so did setters. As we trained really, really hard, and she got us into shape to go to essays for athletics and sprinting. So that was just one component uh, uh, to my the athletics. <laughs> then the rugby, obviously, I didn't touch the rugby ball until I got to the high school. And then Neil Thompson took the ball in my hand and said, Because you're fast, take the ball and dot it down over the white line over there. <laughs> and four tries later, on the 40 Ds, and my first game was fantastic. I just realized you get points if you put the 
fall down flat. <laughs> Just ran. Anyway, eventually that led to such amazing friendships and rugby was a very big part of my life at the school and with my mates. Um, and playing for the first team was special that grade as well. So rugby was pretty much a big deal at grade at that time. It still is, but with a lot of other things that have moved into their rightful place in terms of balance at the school, which I am really excited about in the future. And the same at Paul Riss in Cape Town, where my son is applying to go next year. And my Afrikaans teacher, of course, he had started. Andre had started is now the headmaster there. So he was bragging about beating our first team the other day. He didn't appreciate it much. <laughs> now, moving on. And then in the academic side of things, I mean, I remember so clearly part of the inspiration of why I did medicine was because of the instruction and the passion I had. I see the holiday in the audience. One, one of my favorite teachers at high school is on an emotional supporting level, but also on an academic level. She knew how I felt in my private life. She knew how I felt outside of the day. But really, it's not to me at the time. That's why I got so emotional this morning in the second. So that all flooded and came back to me. And when I looked at that, I thought of the academics. And biology was one of the main focus areas, obviously, that got me interested in the body, into medicine, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Medicine is who I am right now in my life. Very much part of me. I don't want to give up for anything in the world. It's been a passport to the world. Whether it be in Arctica, whether it be with World Rugby, the British Lions, and meeting beautiful people like Sia Felici next to the field in a social capacity, it's been amazing. It's given me a lot. And I can only aspire to give back to the field of medicine. It's coming to do something for the world. It's a great shortage of hands and skill. And not skill so much, but hands. You know, a dramatic shortage of that stuff. All right, so that's our all related to debating and public speaking. Skills, ballroom dancing, I told you, wonderful ways of meeting uh, <coughs> potential suitors. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had a bus stop, it's called the bus stop, where you know, as you go round and round in the school hall, you pick up one of these girls, all nicely clad in their stocking, etc. You take them for a spin, and then you have to drop them off and take the next one. There were some days when there was a good uh, ratio of boys to girls, it's fantastic. Anyway, um, you know, that, just that experience. Oh, I see the smiling there. You're thinking of, did you marry her? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Anyway, so that was all good. But one of the other things that I, that I think is important to mention, especially to you in that inspiring uh, career, asking individuals who are planning your life and looking at how do I develop resilience and greater, taking life's knocks as still. And pursue. Because when you look at the challenges, uh, things like millennial culture, for example, one of the big things are a shortage of delayed gratification, wanting success now and wanting it quickly. I don't want to do what my parents did, paying their home loan for over 40 years. Why? You guys were stupid, they tell us. They say, you don't have to do that. Rather try and make money quicker by taking four different jobs, trying to hit the ceiling quicker in terms of your return on investment. If you fail, you try something else. If you fail, you try something else. We are met with a culture right now that are not scared to risk and to try, rather than have a predictable 40-year journey. And you as parents and grandparents must pull your hair out sometimes when you see a lack of sure stability in some of the youngsters, where they're just doing one thing and they can't finish it. The tasks start off, and then they drop off halfway through, and then they try something new. But in that process, quite interesting on the brain science level, there's a lot going on in terms of innovation, in terms of developing things like problem solving skills, creativity, and so on. That's not obviously provided you're not suffering with severe ADHD and can't finish anything. And you might be helped with that. And it doesn't always mean that you need medication, by the way. Just say, no, pull pop. <laughs> Do that sort of thing. It's a nice topic, by the way. Okay, so everyone with me on, on uh, understanding that. But one of the big things dealing with failure is something really valuable, I think, uh, in terms of performance. Having an opportunity to go. The first times I failed at something, and I'm talking about really, you know, at school you're so focused on probably the day you get into standard six or grade eight, it's the merit system, the merit tie, counting your merits. You remember that? And then you start thinking about good grief, there's so many different accolades that you could actually work on, and you realize that. Sure, I'm so busy with the accolades, I'm missing out just normal play. And a lot of children in the primary school sector, and that 
foundation phase of the building how we refined it. We had not play and having enough free time to free play, which facilitates other great pathways in terms of you know, moving away from the structured environment and living environment all the time. All right, well, maybe there'll be a question or two on that a little bit later. So dealing with failure, I remember I, I said Tony Reader uh, had a bit of a ski wobble with our team in 94. Remember that team, you think? <laughs> 94, it's a tough season, but all, all that everyone remembers is we beat Grand at Grand Island. Chaps got off, picked up the ball under the goals. I got an outside back from Barry, took their set on the outside. Uh, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. Before they did it, we had uh, two tries now, and we had beat Grand Blue in our state of the year. That's all we wanted. We were happy. But in that year, as a coach, with all the critique, and geez, I'm so glad I'm not here to you when I'm a coach at school in these modern times. Just say Because I think they need some serious in your science. <laughs> but anyway, so understanding that that, that component of uh, moving things around, and Tony dropped me for a match as we while he was trying new combinations out of the first team. And I'd be playing, and I was like, where did that come from? I wasn't prepared to be dropped from the first team. I'd be playing solid, I've got a good track record of my mind. Tries, etc. for the game. What happened? And in the game I played seconds against you, I scored four tries, and luckily the Monday I got back into it. <laughs> so, but it was such an important lesson because you don't really often learn to deal with failure young at school. I was thinking about things that are really tough. And then when I went to varsity, I brought Eagles and I were both in studies and Marty's and uh, playing rugby. I would love missing my 8 o'clock class to go to gym and fitting two hours of gym in the morning and then maybe two in the afternoon. That's why I looked at the dinner and then. <laughs> I had the first experience of what they call a Harry Valiero. A rewrite in your life. You know what that's like, to have a rewrite in your life. And my poor mother would only get calls from me saying, please pray, Mom, I'm going to turn exam. <laughs> have you studied? No, I haven't put in as much time. I'm not sleeping through the night, but I'm putting in my best. So you should have put in your best four weeks ago. <laughs> the moms. But anyway, so that, that was real. So dealing with failure, vital component of leadership development, and important in terms of resilience, growth, and tenacity. Not so? So this, I thought, which I wish that the kids at school obviously didn't get out to take part. When we look at this, just to give you an idea why I appreciate the human body so much. Cavemen, adapting. You are so incredibly designed to withstand threat and to survive. What happens to the human body when it's placed under threat? If we had a lion walking here right now, a real lion, what would happen? All the ladies would give their high pitched screams and all the men would run for the exercise. <laughs> Understanding what happens to your pupils when you're under threat? They don't think, why? They need to allow light in, the maximum light in, so that you can focus on your threat Look for weaknesses in it to plan an attack or look for the exit signs and run away and plan instead. It's proper, it's real. What happens to your heart rate? Up or down? Up, up, up. Why? It needs to pump oxygen to the brain so you can think of a problem solving uh, connection and then do something about it. What, what else happens? You start sweating. Why? Before you start running, you start sweating and you shock and sweat. Why? It's anticipation for you running to cool you down so you don't overheat. Whether you're black, white, or blue, when you get a shot, the Afrikaners say blue, they say they scope your bit. <laughs> <laughs> because your, your blood vessels to the skin constrict, and all the blood is redirected to the vital organs only. And no, that's not a vital organ. <laughs> <laughs> the brain, the heart, the kidneys, and the stomach. <laughs> yeah, I see you. Why, why, why is the blood shunted into the stomach? The last meal, the source of energy and fuel you have, needs to be absorbed quickly so that it can be sent to the, to the muscles as the last meal of energy to help you survive the threat. That's how incredible you are here without thinking about it. That happens without you planning or doing it or doing anything. Okay, so that's, that's survival. And when we're looking at moving forward and reaching levels of performance, we move on to that whole theme of thriving, moving on to a different level of achievement where you focus on, on that kind of thing. So when we get to thriving, there are a few things you need to know about. And let's look at the, this quickly. Let's 
And with that, you can imagine. So you've got different schools of thought to the advantages, disadvantages of having a single sex school versus co ed school. What's better for the brain development? What's better for achievement? What's better for performance? And why? So, you know, those challenges that the poor directors and headmasters face, I think, are significant. And that's why they need to be fueled with the latest developments. And, and they rely largely on the feedback that they get from, from yourselves as, as older generation, but also on parents, specifically the parents. And then, of course, managing the parents' expectations. <coughs> So I just want to encourage the educators in the room and say you are not just an you, you're not just an admin junkie, a pen pusher. It feels like that, your inboxes just drive you mad, you're attending meeting after meeting after Zoom after Zoom. But the reality is when I look in this room and I look at people that have influenced my life, you were that. You saw an angel in my world, like my Mike Angelo did, and you carved and carved until you set them free. That's what the educators in our system are and what they mean to us. And I think we should stop shunting responsibility as parents onto the educators. It's hard. We're all under pressure. We've got time left out. We've got more work. We're struggling to survive in the workplace. And so a lot of our responsibilities come and move over to the school a little bit. You know, that little cocky attitude. That little tone. Ah, the little tone I detect in your voice there, young man. Yeah, because my mom lets me get away with it. So that's where teacher now has to deal with it. Tough. Tough on teachers. Really tough. All right. The educators. Drawing to an end. Is she well or not? Yes or no? <laughs> Tally. Does she have wellness? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> Man? Well, you think she's well? Good. What makes you think she's well? She's old. She's old. She lived long. Yes. <laughs> And if you join us, she had time to put her makeup on and the jewelry, look at that. How many of you don't have time to do that? Now there's so many makeup ladies in the room here. Yeah. So naturally, you just a bit of sunscreen with a little tint. Wonderful, wonderful. So, yeah, the question is does she have quality of life for Italian or not? And for her, does she might have quality of life for what she's looking for. She looks like she's ridden the gravel road, sure. <laughs> And those people, they, are they well? A lot of them work really hard. I showed it to the boys and they identified all the people in that picture. And this is very important. As my closing remark, I know that some of you have to go. If you have to go, I fully understand. But I have to be complete and round this off well. This, uh, my friends, is the drivers of brain performance. This model was designed by Neurozone Global. One of my friends is actually the CEO of the company. Uh, and it's an incredible portrayal of what I think is so simple to teach people what drives brain performance. And it, it divides it up into four groups. You'll see at the bottom here, foundational drivers, these green things, <coughs> emotional drivers, blue things, and then the orange over there, high over there. The foundational stuff is the exercise, nutrition, sleep, silencing your mind. That's the mindfulness and you know, uh, meditation, selective attention. Then you move on to value tagging, and that's the social brain. And then the last one over here is the high order drivers. Executive function, learning, abstraction. So with the confines of this talk, I can't go into all of that, but I want to show you that you can't move on to these outcomes of performance. I'm speaking about learning, abstraction, executive function, unless these foundational drivers are actually being met. The nervous system is designed in a way that if you're not sleeping properly, you're not going to be able to concentrate and build memory. Full stop. If you're not getting four to five sleep cycles, which are 90 minutes long at night, if you're not connecting your sleep cycles and sleeping through for six or seven and a half hours a night, you're not doing your brain a favor. Okay, if you are not, uh, for example, exercising and getting any form of exercise, you're not doing your brain a favor. Did you know that you can continue manufacturing brand new brain cells? by doing specific types of exercise. And the big one, research to summarize, is it. High intensity interval training. Up your heart rate quickly, get it up quickly, like fart leg, get to the right between lap posts. Sprint, and then walk. Sprint, and then walk. That releases a hormone in the brain called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It promotes absolutely new brain cells. Even into your 80s, you can continue developing new brain cells. And people don't know that. In fact, as they get older, they become more immobile and don't realize the value of getting your heart rate up. And you know the different ways of getting your heart rate up. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking about heart dancing. 
not toxic. Anyway, okay, so that's just to give you an outcome of the brain and how wonderful it can actually respond to some of those things. The, the last one that I spoke to the boys in the seminar this morning was that emotional part there, the emotional part, this value chain, goal directiveness, and connective creativity is what's written out there. Your brain's got a structure, I made the guy say the word amygdala, the Greek word for armament. Alright? And that amygdala is so important in terms of value chain. It tells you whether you're under threat or not, whether you move towards something or away from something. If you're at a dinner party, you're like, oh great, someone walks in there, you, you look at them, there's a filter you use to decide, you know, I want to meet that person or look close to them or not. Or there's something that tells you, ah, they must not talk to me. Or you walk into a new place like a church camp bazaar and you think, I don't belong here. I don't feel like I belong here. You're being there saying, move away, I'm feeling threatened. How do you feel when I come to the person? <laughs> Okay, so that amygdala is very important in terms of threat. Okay, so that asks four questions. The amygdala asks four questions. I said, there it is. Am I safe? Where I am. Am I physically safe? Am I emotionally safe? Where I am. In your marriage, in your friendship, in your school, with your staff, in your company, in your committee, do you feel safe emotionally and physically? Are you going to get shot, robbed, or light? in your place of breakfast, if you feel unsafe, you can't be poor. Full stop. Do the boys feel safe when they perform, when they go on tour, when they're living in a the hospital, when they... All those things are worth looking at. Belong. Do I feel a sense of belonging or not? And then the third one is, do you feel that you can make a significant contribution or not? And a simple example of that is, when someone comes and pitches an idea at a meeting, any staff member, any one of your children on a Sunday lunch says, I think you should do this a little bit differently. Maybe not like this. And you think, that's a lovely favor. You shouldn't be telling me that. Mm -hmm. You destroy that person's ability to develop the, the ability to problem solve, be creative, and innovative by doing that. You're not giving them a sense that they can make a sense of a significant contribution, and therefore you lose them. And then when you comprise a group, collective creativity was the last one, the group, you can make yourself, by composing that group well, you can actually achieve amazing things by how you comprise them. You need diverse systems, belief systems, you need to be totally different, they can't all be the same. It's going to kill innovation, it's going to kill creativity. And it will change that angle of looking at things differently, dialectical thinking. If you put everyone in the same group that thinks the same, they're not going to come up with creativity. Alright, moving on. And uh, it says about this. Goal directiveness, the, the point there is, are you aware of the fact that if you just set a goal and write it down on paper, the brain makes a pathway for it? Why is the brain already without even achieving the goal? Just thinking about structuring and writing down on paper, I'm going to start eating healthier. You write down, I'm going to try and eat less carbs this week. <laughs> so putting it on a paper makes a difference to your brain and your ability to actually process it. Don't forget that. Everything that uh, connected creativity I've spoken about already. That's my son and his grandfather. Look at that picture. Isn't that touching? That's beautiful. High order drivers. Now learning abstraction, executive function. I told you, you can't get to that unless you've got the basics in place. So don't underestimate the type of diet you eat, the sleeping pattern. Balancing your mind, dealing with your stress conditions, developing strategies around that stuff to get to become a creative problem solver. You won't get there if you don't deal with that stuff. That's why it's a slog, and that's why our teachers are burnt out, overworked, they're working till heaven at night, marking, and they can't get to the place of just, ah, oh, let's see the future. You know? So we need to actually go, how we break up our, our lost day and our day and, and look at where can we free up time to actually move to that space. Tough. I know it's tough, it's the load of, of admin and stuff that seems to so We all need to take more pictures, so as you go out today, you must take more pics, problem solving, innovation, creativity. Pics, P-I-C. And you only get there if you work on those things that we spoke about. And then from my side, from green to grey, that's me, a young, younger version of me, that's my son with his sensei, and there's our CNI and I at the British Irish Lions uh, turf. Recently, when he was obviously the captain, I was the chief medical officer for the event. So privileged and so honored to be able to, to do and serve people of that level with that skill set and so on. 
So, what have been my most valuable lessons? And this is where I close off the talk today. And I'll be available afterwards for those that are around. Because I know there's a few other commitments that need to happen. It's the following. The highest honors bestowed upon me are fatherhood, husbandhood, and friendship. Right, and we all shift from living inwardly to outwardly the other way. Where we want to leave a legacy behind, and where we want to not only live for ourselves, but those around us. So it's a normal, a developmental phase thing in terms of your life when you move into that space. So don't feel guilty uh, should you start developing the, the desire to be helping your community at the age of 60. It's very normal. You're starting to think about what you leave behind. All right. I spoke to the boys about the difference between success and significance. This school facilitates tremendous opportunities to become successful, but I believe the values of the grade, seriously, that I witnessed and that I believe are still very right in the school, promote significance. If you look at the camaraderie, the bonding that occurs, and why people come back to the school 20 years later, it's not because they had lashings with the headmaster, it's not because they had pay, it's because they have positive association as well. And the, the guys that, that are coming back, Every single year of these reunions speak our testament to that very fact. It's a very strong one that binds people together. And that tells me that the school is working on both success and significance. Significance is not about you, it's about what you can do to influence and inspire others. Whereas success often, unfortunately, gives you that and it acknowledges you. It's a successful time that turns in the world. And then I end off with this. On a very personal level, these are the hard knock life hits that I've learned the most since the beginning of the day in 27 years. And these are, these are in a very simple, non particular order. This life is not just about you and what you can get from it. It's the first thing. The second thing is, because it's facilitated creative things, ask many questions. Why? Why not? And what if? That will immediately make you become more creative. And it's okay. Don't shut people up when they ask questions. That's what I'm saying. Be real, be consistent in who you are. And one of the hardest lessons that I've to learn is it's okay, not everyone has to like you. Yes, it's under you, you live under tremendous pressure if you expect everyone to like you and to demonstrate that liking of you enough. You'll never be happy. But there's some people that choose to be unhappy and then they blame you for it too, by the way. <laughs> and then uh, the, the next one is if you give respect to people when you speak to them, the tone, the time, the patience, the way you listen, you'll, you'll earn that respect too. If you give it. You start with yourself first. Give more and expect less in return. That mindset helps liberate you from so much disappointment in people and situations. You live a much happier life. A little kindness has an exponential impact on others and the world. Just a little kindness. Choose to focus on things that you have in common with others. I mentioned that to Dada Lama, I mentioned that as well as the point of departure. And you are more, more than a victim of your circumstances. The circumstances into which you are born do not define you. And that's a wonderful thing for anyone. You can't choose your genes. Maybe you wanted bigger calves. Maybe you wanted a different jawline. Eh? <laughs> yeah, anyway. So give more expect this. And the last thing I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, is listen to understand people. And uh, cultivate patience. And from patience you can learn so much. So I hope there's been something for everyone in today's talk. And I hope it's been a good to some of